Mr Crispin here once again and hello to the viewers. Now the UK is currently in coronavirus lockdown but progress on the locomotive must continue and today's video is the start of a new three part series titled Machining Pistons and Rods and in this series I'm going to manufacture some components to complement the cylinder blocks that I have produced over eight instalments. Now before we go any further let me introduce you to the components. First of all a look at the drawing. We can see here the main power piston and the piston rod and the valve piston and its rod. Now this is often termed a bobbin or spool valve but for all intents and purposes it is a piston and as it goes up and down it controls the valve events either letting steam in or letting exhaust out. Now for valve setting purposes the position of this piston on the rod can be adjusted by means of these nuts. So there's an entire threaded length here and by moving the nuts you can move the piston up and down the rod. The power piston however is fixed and uh, the first thing I'm actually going to look at here is exactly how this is fixed. Now the plans for this locomotive actually suggest that I have a thread the same diameter as the rod and run the thread all the way through the piston. And I found something in my scrap box to help me illustrate this. It's suggesting that I just have a thread that runs to a uh, shaft of a similar diameter and then a piston threaded all the way through that just winds on and eventually stops. Now I don't like this design for two reasons. First of all, what's it actually stopping on? If you think about the two threads in question, the internal and the external, it's stopping when you run out of external thread. And as that happens, the whole thing binds up. Now, uh, hopefully I won't have as much play as this in my threads, but in any threaded system there is play. And if it just runs out like that, the whole assembly is thrown out of alignment and I risk losing the uh, concentricity between the piston and the shaft. Equally, um, although it's unlikely to just wind itself off, there is nothing stopping it just winding off should it ever come loose. So, sorry Martin Evans, but I have redesigned your piston, and I have done so in the following manner. I have reduced the thread diameter to a quarter inch to give me a shoulder at this section here. I have added a lock nut on the back, and I have incorporated a parallel bore to accept the rod diameter, which will go a long way to ensuring concentricity between the two components. So the rod will wind all the way in up to the shoulder, the lock nut will then come on the back and sandwich the assembly and the parallel diameter will help align the components. So that should go a long way to improving the situation. Now I'm going to spare you the whole design lecture but as I go through if I come across any interesting bits to point out I will do so. The thing I really need to say is that the important thing on both these components as well as the dimensions is the alignment and the concentricity. So the rod and the piston must be aligned and they must be concentric. And you can do that by uh, tightly controlling tolerances and working carefully. But my preferred way to do it is to leave metal on crucial surfaces, build the assembly and then finish the thing as an assembly. Uh, to illustrate that partly, here's the drawing I'm working to for the piston. Now the numbers uh, are irrelevant to you, but I've put on a dotted green line. And this green line shows the surfaces that are going to have metal left on. And as you can see, the bore is going to be finished totally in the first dot. And once the rods are then made, the two will be assembled and finished as an assembly. You could refer to this as what's called a stage drawing. This shows the dimensions you're actually working to for the first dot. Anyway, so it's over to the lathe. I'm doing the pistons out of cast iron and I'm doing the rods out of rustless steel. I have enough material sticking out to get both pistons and I'm holding it in a forejaw for a bit of extra gripping power. Now it may look like I'm moving on to the internal work but while I've got this centre here I'm actually going to make use of it and put a steady in the tailstock and use it to give me some support while I put the grooves in. Now anyone who's ever done much parting or grooving on a small lathe will know exactly why I'm doing this and that is because the operations like this are prone to chatter so along that line 
I have also made sure the tool geometry and presentation is correct and I've also reduced the spindle speed. Also I have ran the top side back until there's no overhang. That makes sure it's well supported from underneath. Now to do this grooving up I'm going to reference the edge of the tool on this face and then pitch over. Um, I could try and be clever and put in all the grooves for both pistons but I only have enough material to make two pistons and I can see myself um, regretting having tried to be clever. So I'll do it one at a time and uh, we will take it from there. One of the beauties of finishing things in the last stop is that at the moment I can still use this face to set tools off or uh, anything else and I don't worry about marking it. Pitching over or longitudinal travel on this machine is done by means of a lead screw hand wheel. So this is a hand wheel connected directly to the main lead screw and uh, to operate it you do the following. First of all you disengage the gearbox leaving the lead screw free to travel. You then engage the half nuts and now when I actually wind this hand wheel the lead screw turns and it in turn moves the saddle. Now this lead screw has a pitch of 125 thou and there are 125 divisions on here so uh, one division equals a thou's worth of travel on the carriage. Very useful and um, really improves the machine's uh, usability. The only downside of this is the dial is not zeroable so uh, in other words you can't set this to zero having found a position so you have to do a lot of mental maths. Quick double check Well even with that preparation I've still ended up with some chatter so uh, what I'm going to do is drop the spindle speed again but if I don't get rid of that chatter whatever I do I'm going to struggle so here's a little tip on a small machine for getting the chatter out before you attempt to cut again bring the tool back in rotate the chuck by hand and it will start to cut and just gently feed in and keep winding round until all the chatter is gone and I can feel through my hand that's winding the chuck that that's now a nice consistent um, surface and the chatter is gone. So I'm going to reduce the spindle speed, try again and that should solve the problem. So I have reduced the spindle speed again um, no harm done, just makes a slower progress. And now the feed rate can maintain itself. Wonderful. To measure these grooves I will be checking a position from the front face, so a position to this groove and a position to this groove and then I'll be checking the width internally in each respective case. So to take this groove to its uh, correct stage dimension I need to take 9 thou amp. 9 thou coming off the side face. Now I'm having to use these measurement techniques because my uh, normal go-to for roughing out stuff has gone silly. It started producing random numbers and uh, for once not down to my machining. Um, if anyone knows how you fix this please let me know. I did admittedly get them off eBay but um, they've been working fine for about two years. Anyway that groove is now to size and I'm going to pitch over and repeat the process for the second groove. With the grooves acceptable I am now turning my attention to the internal work. Now to give these threads the best chance I guess I could screw cut them but at a quarter inch diameter internal screw cutting gets rather fiddly. Instead I'm going to use a tap but to give the tap the best chance of producing a well aligned thread I'm actually going to um, 
bore out the tapping diameter. So rather than drill it, I'm going to use this little boring bar I've ground up to produce a nice parallel and well aligned bore. Um, also I'm going to bore the diameter to match the piston rod and I'm just going to put a little relief counter bore in here so that when the piston rod shoulder comes up to here I don't suffer from any thread pull out interferences. Now I did consider trying to bore all three sections in the same setup so I would probably have started with this side at the front, bored the counter bore, done the threads and then back bored this section in but I really want to get a good fit on the piston rod so I, I want this exposed to do so uh, and that would have meant starting on this side and then trying to back bore out to this 5 8 diameter uh, possible but to get enough tool stick out to do that you'd have to have a very thin bar because the boring bar has obviously got to get in there before it can start back boring so I'm doing this in a separate op so uh, these bores are coming up next Top slide set at 45 and then it's a case of finding the corner and feeding back out the required depth of the brake edge. Now on this uh, corner I'm going to be putting the brake edge on 4 thou extra deep so that when I take that face back 4 thou to finish size it leaves me a brake edge of the required dimension. To tap this hole I am using the rigid tapping method whereby I have a tap locked in the tailstock chuck and I'm going to rotate the spindle by hand and allow the whole tailstock unit to be dragged forward as the tap advances. All done now and uh, onto a few brake edges then part off. All done. There is a piston op one number one. And that's nearly piston two op one, however I've made a little error. I did not include enough distance for the second part off in my overall stick out. So the blade holder is actually going to hit the chuck jaws here. Now if anyone's asking, I of course did this deliberately to maximise setup rigidity. And it's not a problem, I'll just have to pull the component out and part it off. And a quick word on parting off actually. These little holders are fairly common in model engineering and for small lathes. They feature a high speed steel uh, blade that is extendable or retractable. And when I got it I took a test cut with it and I would have been satisfied had I been trying to produce a satellite dish because it produced the kind of radius that you would typically find on a banana tree and the cause for this was that this whole blade has ended up slightly skewed and uh, the bottom of the blade was actually protruding beyond the top cutting surface so it was doing a lot of rubbing. To um, sort the matter out I had to put a relief grind on to regain a, a reasonable rake angle uh, and I also decided to grind the top surface of the cutting edge to a positive rake and uh, it seems to have done the job. The piston I just parted off has uh, come out within a thou of being parallel. So uh, I'm pleased with that. On to OP2 now and this is rather straightforward turning but what matters is the alignment and if we look at what I'm actually going to be machining it's a back face and counter ball. Now if this back face isn't square then as the knot does up it is going to be applying forces unevenly. So I'm going to try and get this back face as square as possible to the previous work and I'm doing that with the use of a dial indicator. I have got it running out in uh, the radial direction to a um, little under 2 microns, that's just under a tenth by the way and also axially speaking it is running out about the same
and that's uh, well and truly parallel so now onto the ball Well there we have it, two uh, pistons ready for mounting on rods and finished machining. Well that's it for part one, in part two we'll be moving on to the valve bobbins and all the knots required. I hope you've enjoyed watching and see you on the next video.